Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Philip Securities Research Morning Call for 19 June 2023. For today, we have stock counter updates for power integrations, city developments, and top glow. We also have technical analysis for S&P 500 and macro updates like F FOMC meeting highlights. And as usual, we would end the session with Singapore Weekly. Without further ado, I would like to pass on to Max for power integrations. Thanks, Ambrish, and good morning, everyone. We hosted power integrations for a guest webinar last week, and this is the Philip on the ground. Next slide. Now, just as a disclaimer, this counter is not rated. A power integration has a market cap of around $5.2 billion, and it is a semiconductor company specializing in the power management integrated circuits, or ICs. In terms of their revenue, 90% uh, of their sales comes from their ACDC converter products or what they call as low power business. And this ACDC converter is used in any electronic devices or appliances such as our smartphones or, or aircon or even washing machines, which where, where the, and these ICs are used to convert the high voltage power in, on the wall to a lower voltage so that it can be used in these devices. And then the remaining 10% is used if 10% uh, of the sales is from the gate drivers products or the or what they call as high power. And most of these uh, products are used in solar or wind power generators. So for their products, they really they focus specifically only on high voltage power converters. And their flagship product is under the Eno Switch product line. And the difference between Eno Switch uh, against the and the products by their competitors is that Inno Switch is an integrated IC, meaning that it, it combines several other external components onto a single chip, whereas uh, the competitors only produce the discrete chips. So, for example, if the customer decides to use the Inno Switch by power integrations, they only need to source for about 50 uh, other components to, so that they can design their power supply. Whereas if they use the component the, the products by their competitors, the customers needs to uh, source for about 100 other components. So in, in, in other words, power integrations products really simplifies the design process of their customers. Then one interesting fact uh, from the presentation is that uh, power integration puts a lot of emphasis on this new material called GAN or gallium nitride, which they say is expected to replace silicon as the main uh, material for switches at least and this is because it is more efficient because it, it has lower switching losses and at the same time it has a higher speed as well and power integration feels that this GAN technology will enable them to increase their ASP and drive revenue growth in the future and then some of the theories that power integration is seeing is that there's increasing demand for advanced charger meaning that for example for smartphones uh, phone makers uh, require <laughs> charges that can output higher power, but at the same time in a smaller form factor. And then there's also the increasing trend of EV, IoT, electrification, and decarbonization. So because of these trends, power integration is expecting the total addressable market to double by 2027 uh, from the current $4 billion to $8 billion uh, uh, in, in 2027. So yeah, some of the earliest signs of these trends happening is the fact that there's, also, there's more stringent efficiency requirements for appliances in countries like China and India, specifically for their aircon and washing machines, which means that uh, the, the products for power integration is benefiting from this. Uh, is benefiting from this. And then there's also <clears throat> an increasing number of electrical components uh, required in EV compared to the compared to the conventional vehicles. And because of this, the power integration is hoping that they can they are able to expand and break into the automotive market even more. Yeah, so in terms of the financials, power integration says that their revenue has grown at a 9.5% since 2001. And this outpaced the growth of their analog semiconductor uh, uh, peers. And the company says that it has a sticky customer base and it also enjoys the benefit from a long product life cycle. And this is because their customers tend not to want to redesign their products as often. So for example, for a smartphone company, they don't really want to redesign their charges as much because firstly, it costs R&D expenses to do so. And secondly, uh, customers don't really decide whether to 
don't really decide whether to buy a smartphone based on whether they upgrade their charges from the past year. And because of this, um, about 40% of their sales are still from the products that they launched about 10 to 15 years ago. Yeah, then, uh, however, they didn't really go through uh, their financials, but uh, upon uh, but their first quarter results were down by 42% year on year. And this is actually in line with the overall semiconductor industry, whereby the whereby the consumer tech as well as appliances sales are down. So yeah, they, are, they say that they are in the down cycle at the moment. So yeah, that's all for power integrations. And I hand over my time to Darren to talk about CDL. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we issued an update report on CDL. Yeah, the title of the report is Hospitality Segment to Drive Growth. Yeah, so for CDL here, are my, our investment highlights. We think that the impact of the cooling measures are man manageable for CDL, mainly because the cooling measures are mainly targeting <coughs> the foreigners, as, like they increase the APSD from 30% to 60% for the foreigners, and they're also targeting more uh, of the investors rather than first-time home buyers so uh, because of that uh, uh, cdl they delayed the launch of newport residences which is their high-end uh, luxury uh, property <clears throat> so they uh, it was actually scheduled for launch at uh, late april but then a few days before their, their scheduled launch there was these cooling measures and as a result uh, they decided to delay the launch uh, we think that they'll probably launch a later part of the year or early next year. Now, however, they, they also have another development, the MIST. So the MIST is on track for second half 23 launch. Uh, they are continuing uh, launching the MIST because it is more of a mid-tier development rather than a high-end development. And the MIST uh, targets a lot of uh, locals. And they also uh, recently launched the Musu Grand. So that was uh, well received with 56% of the project sold at a ASP uh, average selling price of 2465 So this shows that the property market is still very hot right now, like at the ASP of 2465 And if you look at the chart, or rather the table on the top, so that is the inventory that CDL has. And right now, most of it is already sold. Like, uh, more, most of it is like upwards of 90% sold. And they are, uh, going forward, there's also a limited amount of the limited number of developments because of uh, all these uh, cooling measures and such. Uh, yeah. So the next investment highlight is that I think the hospitality segment will benefit from continue to benefit from travel recovery. So currently, the portfolio repa for the first quarter is such sixty five percent year on year, uh, due to a strong recovery in Asia and Australia, and the ADRs also increased twenty seven point one percent. And there was a 15.5 percentage point increase in occupancy to 67 percent. So going forward, we think that uh, the ADS can maintain or or increase slightly, but not to the extent that they increased over the past year because of a higher base. And a lot of countries, their ADR has already reached uh, pre-COVID levels. So the the growth in REPA going forward will come from the occupancy rather than uh, ADRs. And so so we, we expect uh, REPA to continue growing. But a slower pace. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so the other investment merit, uh, highlight is that CDL is growing their fund management AUM. So this segment is you can look at it as a recurring kind of recurring income segment rather than the property development, which is quite lumpy for their for the income. So uh, CDL they acquired St Catherine Docks is a mixed use development in the UK for about four hundred uh, billion uh, four hundred million pounds. So this brings them closer to their five billion USD target, uh, for the year end at again uh, twenty twenty three, and right now their total valuation for the UK is at over one billion pounds. So this acquisition will of course enhance their recurring income stream. So this makes use developments and catering dots. Uh, their office, uh, their commercial segment is upwards of ninety five uh, ninety percent occupied. So it's uh, doing quite well. Uh, and this acquisition of St. Catherine Docks also, they will help to, uh, they will give CDL the option to inject uh, these UK assets into some listed or unlisted platform in the future. Like, as you all know, um, last year they, they wanted to list, to, to have a UK uh, commercial read, but the plans fell through as the market wasn't uh, very conducive for read listing last year. 
And the last investment highlight for us is that CDL is trying to build their recurring income stream as, uh, under this living sector. So the, under the living sector, they have a PBSA, like Purpose Built Student Accommodation, and a private rented sector, PRS. So in the past year, CDL, they acquired six PBSAs in the UK and two PRS sites in Australia and five PRS projects in Japan. So it, it was CDL's first foray into uh, PBSAs. And right now they have 2,400 bits after the acquisition. And uh, this acquisition spans across five cities in, in the UK and they have strong occupancy of 98% for the academic year 22, 23. And the leasing momentum is also expected to remain good going forward for the group's 10 uh, private, private rented sector assets in Japan as uh, they continue to perform and they enjoy stable rents in Japan with an average occupancy of above 95%. And for the PRS sector in the UK, they see uh, they are leasing for the leasing zone going for the junction, which is their uh, PRS development in UK. So this is uh, due to rent. They are, CDL is, they are, they are moving, they are shifting their strategy in the UK to more of a build to sell to a build to rent where you, you build to rent and then you get the recurring income stream. So this is part of it. And this uh, development, it obtained practical completion for three out of five blocks, which is about three, about half of the units available. So yeah, right now, uh, the leasing is ongoing for this. So uh, just for background, they they bought the land in 2019, then they're developing and they are trying to rent it out. And they'll rent it out for and, and this is under the recurring income segment under the living sector. So so this is the strategy for for the, the UK side under this living sector. Yeah, uh, next slide please. Yeah, so for the outlook, as you can see in the top right hand side of the graph, um the Property price index for the whole island, yeah, it increased for past five, it's been increasing for the past five years. Like in 2018, you see it's 150 and now it's almost at 194. So because of this red hot uh, property prices, we expect more cooling measures to come. But if we look at the past few cooling measures, it targeted uh, mainly the high end and luxury properties with, uh, which are in the prime areas. And the demand for all these properties are mostly are coming from uh, foreigners, which is why uh, like they increase ABSD for foreigners like from 30 to 60%. And, and because and, and they're targeting the foreigners rather than like the mass market and mid-tier segments and first uh, first time home buyers. So if this trend continues, uh, CDR will be lesser impacted because their upcoming projects, most of it are in the mid-tier segment rather than the high-end uh, luxury uh, segment. That their only high end segment is from Newport is a Newport residences, which they delayed their, their launch earlier this year. And uh, with that, we have a we maintain our accumulate with a lower target price of eight dollars and thirty three cents, and this represents a forty five percent discount to our RNAV of fifteen thirteen. If you look at the bottom right hand chart, that is a historical price to NAV uh, performance of CDL. Uh, right now, you can take a look. It's trading at below the one standard deviation mark, and the the average is the red line. So right now, uh, it's it's trading cheap compared to its uh, historical a uh, ten year average. Now we we view CDL as a proxy to the Singapore residential market and the hospitality recovery. Yeah, so uh, that's all probably for CDL. I now hand over the time to Sean. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thanks, Darren. So I'll be going through the uh, meeting highlights that happened on the 14th of June last Wednesday. So last week, the Federal Reserve has decided to maintain the federal fund rate at a range of 5 to 5.25%, as they believe that the uncertain lags from the previous uh, monetary policies and the potential headwinds from the credit tightening due to the banking spiral that occurred uh, in the first, half, uh, first quarter uh, of this year have yet to be felt. So this is the first rate pause after 10 consecutive high which has started back in March last year. But uh, this pause was in line with uh, market expectations. So in terms of guidance, uh, during the meeting, uh, hawkish sentiment so, uh, mentioned that nearly all community, uh, committee participants uh, viewed it as uh, it is likely for some uh, further rate increases uh, to be appropriate uh, this year, bringing down the inflation back to 2%. And also uh, rate cuts uh, will be unlikely uh, this year. 
So if you want to shift your attention to the left of the screen, uh, you'll be able you'll be able to see the dot plot graph uh, that was provided in this meeting. So nine out of uh, eighteen officials are expecting uh, rates to be above the range of five point five to five point seven five percent uh, in twenty twenty three, while three of them indicates uh, it to move even higher. And according to the uh, summary of economics uh, projection or SEP in short. The terminal uh, projected rate for this year has been bumped up to 5.6% uh, from 5.1% uh, previously. So this further supplements to the guidance that were that we should be facing uh, at least another 50 basis point hike this year in order to reach this projected rate. And, and we also should anticipate a 100 basis point uh, cut in the following year when the projected rate tapers down to 4.6%. And also, uh, although recent inflationary data points, such as the PCE and as well as the CPI index that the Federal Reserve watches closely, have shown signs of moderation since June last year, back when uh, I think total and cost PCE was rising approximately 7% as well as 5% year on year, the latest result for the total core and uh, total and core PCE has released in April has rose by 4.4 and 4.7% year on year. Meanwhile, I, uh, I believe the May's core CPI rose above, uh, rose by 5.6 and 5.3 percent year on year. So these have uh, shown that inflationary pressures still remain sticky, and also well above the federal fund uh, targeted range of two percent. So I mean to conclude, uh, it appears that the hike cycles are continuing for at least uh, two more times this year before we hit the terminal rate that was projected in this meeting. However, the question is, will the terminal uh, rate trend even higher than 5.6% this year? I mean, considering the fact that the community has started, uh, uh, I mean, stated that the delay effect from the previous tightening has yet to be fully felt, and despite the inflationary the data pointers are not trending down as quickly, it does uh, reflect uh, signs that the economy is indeed slowing down. Hence, uh, for the terminal rate to be bumped up even higher, uh, it is kind of unlikely. However, in if inflation were to surge again, then uh, additional actions may be taken by the Federal Reserve. Uh, that's all I have for the meeting. And with that, I'd like to hand over the time to Zain to share on technicals. Thank you. Sean, uh, good morning, everyone. So now I'll give a technical sharing of the S&P 500. So for S&P 500, uh, last week we managed to break out above the 4,300 level, which was the swing high uh, created in August of last year. So we saw a continuation of the bullish momentum. And if we continue on, uh, we could hit 4,500 next, which is uh, another psychological level as well as the uptrend channel, resist, uh, uptrend channel resistance that's inside. Uh, a higher resistance point would be likely at 4,630, which was the March uh, swing high last year. As for current support, should we do a retest of the breakout, then we will likely see support coming in around 4,260 to about 4,330 area, which was the levels that we broke out recently. Uh, so that's all from me now. Uh, I'll pass my time to Paddy to give a feel on the ground on top curve. Thank you, Zane. Morning, everyone. Uh, top curve had their results, uh, third quarter results released last Friday. These are the highlights of the results and the outlook that they share with us. Uh, we, top Gloves is the biggest uh, maker of healthcare gloves in the world. They originally had 100 billion uh, annual capacity, but now it's also, also looking to cut that capacity just like Hatha Liga. Okay. The third quarter continued to fall in terms of revenue. It's dropped 14% uh, quarter on quarter from the second quarter. The Top Gloves, uh, for the first time, tried to move ASP up by 6% to cover the higher raw material prices. But that also means that the volume suffered. Volume, volume fell 21% quarter on quarter. And some, they lost some market share to competitors. Still, they think they, they, they estimate they have about 20 to 25% of the entire market currently. The North America was the only country that had a growth of 26% Q on Q, uh, but on a very, very weak uh, second Q uh, numbers. The other countries were all, uh, all fallen in, in terms of revenue. And the smaller net quarterly loss was also because of a tax write back. And they, they did not do any write down in inventory and plant and equipment this, in this quarter. Second quarter, because of the price decline in terms of uh, gloves, 
uh, they have to write down their inventory value. So uh, inventory suffer when, when ASP is down. Okay. They announced that they are going to decommission 5 billion capacity or 5% of their total capacity. But still, they at the moment, they're still idling like another 35 billion capacity. So operating only 60 billion capacity. And we estimate based on the numbers working back, backwards, this uh, 60 billion capacity is only operating at about 40% utilization. Uh, this, which explains why they, they are actually well below the break even level. They cut headcount by almost half from the peak of 23,000 to 12,000 more. Still looking to further down back size the capacity. Um, just like Hataliga has, has announced that they are uh, decommissioning 40, 40 production lines. Uh, about, we estimate it's about the same size as the amount that, that uh, Top Girl has this decommissioned. But still, I think the industry still has more room to go to, to cut capacity. Uh, some products are being so ex inventory right now for top love as they no longer want to produce it and, they are, and if they, the more they produce the more they lose so like vinyl glove they are not producing anymore their average selling price about 18 to 19 US dollar per thousand pieces also suggests that uh, they, uh, they are loss making they, they should need about 21 uh, 21 to 22 dollars US dollar per thousand to break even. And as the capacity drop, volume decline, unit cost actually will be higher. We also note that uh, they had an increase in debtor stays to for three days uh, currently. In the past, it's usually a, a low, uh, uh, low number, less than 20 days. Last year, it went up to 26 days. But this, this increase is, uh, we, we are uncomfortable because uh, this, they mainly sell to distributors who actually uh, buy uh, using LC. So the, the creeping, the data stays creeping up is not a good sign. The, for, the good thing, good news is the raw material prices are, are falling. The, the, for nitrile and the natural rubber, both are going to decline uh, by single digit this coming quarter. For gas tariffs is also coming down after a 16% reduction in April. Uh, uh, natural NAS gas is cutting that by another 11% in July. They, they are still hoping to raise ASP in the coming quarter, but they concede that it will be difficult. When raw material prices are down, uh, customers are uh, very resistant to the price increase. And in fact, they, they might even ask for, for a reduction in ASP. We, so we see the management thinks that the next quarter or fourth quarter will still be a, a loss. So FY23, is, you can forget about it totally. Um, the, we, we think this will apply across the sector too for other healthcare glove makers. Uh, customers are ordering smaller quantity because there's a shorter lead time. You, you can get your, your goods very quickly. And the management estimates there's still about 10 to 20% excess inventory in the system. So um, we... we we think this will, the read through is the, the healthcare growth sector is going to be sluggish. Uh, or the only player that might stand out will be Riverstone, who is into uh, producing clean room growth, where clean room growth are, sell, are sold directly to the end user. So they, they negotiate directly with the, 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 the uh, makers of uh, semiconductors, chips, and, and electronic devices. And they also, uh, Riverstone also secure new customers in Japan. And in Penang, having additional capacity coming up, they, have, they, are, they are also having more orders from Penang. But this, this is all for Top Glove. Uh, move on to the weekly uh, of our strategy. Okay, this is a tactical view uh, it's the way I read it. Uh, Sean brief us on the FOMC uh, rate pause uh, for June. But uh, in the, if you read, when we read through the uh, the statements, there's a signal uh, that more might be needed uh, to bring to to cope with the inflation. the The revised media media dot is five point six percent, which is about fifty basis point of rate hikes expected this year. But next year, twenty twenty four, uh, the the it has been the indicated dot media dot is four points. 
that implies a hundred basis point of decline of cuts in 2024. As the, the, the committee also see called PCE inflation falling from 3.9% to 2.6%. Uh, ECB likewise hiked the 25 basis point in the latest um, meeting. The deposit rate now is at 3.5%. It was negative 0.5% one year ago. We'll show how much the increase and the impact to the corporate's earnings. Uh, Singapore side, we also have uh, some negative data coming out from the non-oil domestic exports. That fell 14.7% year on year in May. It's, that was a bigger decline from compared to April of 9.8%. This is 10 consecutive months of decline, uh, led mainly by electronics. In integrated, integrated circuits especially, uh, the exports fell 39.2% year on year. The decline actually happened across all countries except for China and US. But even in these two countries, the, the increase is marginal, very, very small. And compared to a very large de decline in April, there's nothing to shout about. So these numbers, uh, uh, Singapore uh, usually announced our advanced estimate for the, the uh, preceding quarter, the GDP estimates in the first few days of the next month. So early July, we will have the advanced estimate for June quarter uh, GDP. And they will, use, they will use the April and May number to estimate this, this advanced GDP. So it looks like we will we see another quarter and quarter decline. After the uh, first quarter, we had a decline of 1.9% uh, Q and Q. So this is the second quarter quarterly decline. Uh, 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 we, we call this a technical recession coming. True. Um, so the it's it's not it's not uh, good for the for the numbers going forward for the Singapore GDP numbers. In China, we also have a very weak set of data points from China last week. Industrial production was up only three point five percent compared with April of five point six. Fixed asset investments, which indicates capacity expansion expenditure, it was up four percent. Compared with April, 4.7%. Retail sales was the only bright spot, up 12.7%, but still it was lower than April's 18.4%. So these are the webinars we are, come, we are having uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, can, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, just, just a uh, deeper read into the, the charts. Uh, Singapore known oil domestic exports here and here. See, the decline is fairly sharp. We look at the especially the, the green line that is the integrated circuits it actually down it's more, more like down to almost 40 percent um uh, the, we, we haven't seen this kind of decline for a long time and the the total not all domestic exports is also uh we can fall after after a very sharp uh, January decline now it's on the downtrend again Index of industrial production, which indicates the output from the manufacturing, Singapore manufacturing, is, is down uh, negative since October last year. Considering that we had the very uh, stronger uh, numbers from the, from the marine, the offshore marine and the aer aerospace sector, so they, it just show that the electronic side is definitely very, very weak. Okay, so there's a likely GDP contraction in second quarter. Well, next slide, please, thanks. So back to China, uh, we see very weak economic indicators. Industrial production has slowed from to 3.5% year on year uh, growth now. It actually was, was rising up very nicely, especially post reopening, but May, May was a disappointment. And the capacity, uh, capex spend has shown a week has been weakening. And now down to four percent, um, uh, 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 on the on the street, uh, quite a number of economists, Chinese economists, are are, are revising downwards their GDP forecast for this year. Next one, please. Thank you. Okay. so retail sales in China is the only one that uh, shows a very strong growth. Uh, at it, but in April there was a twelve point seven percent increase, but that. But if you look back in the in May, sorry, but if you look back in May last year, the there was a, the decline was fairly sharp. So we really need to see the June numbers to, to indicate where things are heading. 
because June was already a positive growth um, uh, last year. Okay, so to, in reaction to all this, the, the authority has cut uh, the medium term LFR. This, this cut is significant because you and uh, from the chart, you can tell that they had been pausing this rate uh, after uh, COVID. They, they had an early recovery from COVID. So the, the, it was a very, very uh, period of uh, pause, but uh, the, the cut has accelerated. And, and after, after pausing for since August last year, they again uh, initiated this cut. This LFR typically translates very quickly into the mortgage rates, uh, therefore have a uh, bigger impact on the property sector, uh, bigger immediate impact on the property sector. So we think that the, the, this is a signal that the central government, the central authority in China are, are, are putting more emphasis and urgency onto the reviving the consumption and the property. So the policies are being rolled out in the next few, next couple of weeks, even uh, leading up to the July Politburo meeting, the, there will be some targeted um, measures to, to help the, the property sector. Um, maybe not so much into pumping liquidity back into the developers, but more so to, to make sure that uh, buyers are more confident right now and, not, and some of the restrictive uh, measures for, for acquiring properties are, are, not, are, being, uh, are, are probably going to be lifted, such as a, a restriction on borrowing, a restriction on buy, purchase, uh, restriction on uh, down payment, etc. So, so uh, uh, we we think they they are the China might be um, more interesting going in the next quarter. This all we have for today. Maybe we can move on to the Q and A. Please type your questions in the Q and A chat, uh, and uh, we we will take that and. Um, uh, we read out the questions and we are answering as, as we go along. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I'll start the Q&A. Um, then with the latest FOMC meeting highlights your views on when one should start looking at or wait for further price actions for CLI, infantry reads and capital land reads. Yeah, so the FOMC meeting highlights, as uh, Sean and Peggy just now mentioned, we are, um, we are expecting, maybe, I mean, the fact they indicated that they might increase the rates another two times. So that will really hurt all the all these REITs and property companies. And one thing to note is that all the, the impact of all these high interest rates, it will only be felt like uh, within one or two years is the because as they reprice their loans then all, all this will start to take into effect. So yeah the full impact of the high interest rate has not really been felt yet from all these streets. So that is definitely one of the biggest savings for all these uh, property and REIT companies. So uh that also definitely affected by the sentiment as as you all know if you know the, the FMC they keep raising rates then definitely the uh, sentiment will still remain weak for a while, but hopefully, if uh, especially if they they, first, they, they mentioned that they they probably pause it and and stop raising rates, and that will be a huge catalyst for for these companies. So uh, for CLI, we we maintain our some of the parts valuation of four twelve. So right now, I, I believe it's trading at about three dollar plus. So we we think uh, fundamentally is still sound. Yeah, but uh, for the TA part, uh, as we went to enter, uh, yeah, that one have to uh, does Zane to assist us. Yeah, but fundamentally, it's, it's still quite challenging for, for the REITs, especially when the REITs and CLI, especially with the high interest rates. Yeah, I think that's all for me. And the rest of my colleagues, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Aaron. Um, there's this question on power integration. Uh, referring to Joe Schiffler's presentation last week, he mentioned investing and innovating to extend SAM. What does SAM means and what does TAM means in your presentations today? So, yeah, uh, 
basically what 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 he referred to as SAM is serviceable addressable market, which is actually similar to total addressable market, which is TAM, which is the terms that I use today. Uh, yeah, we, there's not really much difference between the two. Um, if you want a nitty gritty de definition, is that SAM is like the subset of TAM, but anyway, we we just treat it like the same. So yeah, SAM is serviceable addressable market, whereas TAM is total addressable market. But in this case, that in our presentation and his presentation, we are referring to the same thing. Hope that's answer. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Thanks, Max. I, I'll take the question on uh, Mr. Peter Lai. Okay. Uh, see, Peggy, with integrated circuits dropping so much in past months consecutively, is Singapore losing ground in exports of IC? Uh, I, I, uh, I don't think so. Yeah. I think this, this uh, trend has been mirrored across uh, the region. Um, if you look at the uh, Korea, Taiwan, the, the numbers are the same. Uh, so since uh, May, May last year, May 2022, we had a record high IC exports. After that, uh, it's all the way down from, from there. Uh, and uh, the year-on-year -year decline happened in August last year. Yeah. So, so it's actually in response to the global uh, chip sector. I don't think we are losing ground, but, but uh, uh, suffice to say, we had a lot of exports. Also now, instead of going directly to uh, China or Taiwan, they also pass through to Malaysia, uh, and then and then uh, on shipment out. So so uh, Malaysia might be gaining some share there, but uh, probably too early to say we are losing ground in the exports. Uh, I see. The the second question is, uh, Peggy, with the with the Singapore's steeper decline in Nodex. What are the stocks that are opportunities and worth looking into? Okay, our Nodex is really a lot about uh, the manufacturing sector. And, and uh, only three, uh, the, the, the three big components are really IC. And then in the non-electronics non products, we have the, we have the uh, chemicals that swing things around. And sometimes we have pharmaceuticals as well. So the, the integrated circuits uh, account for like half of the total electronics products output. So therefore, integrated circuits is the most um, important. We, we are watching this number closely because it, it relates to some of the uh, semicon players, listed semicon uh, companies we have on the SGX. But I, I can't um, remember, I can't think of any companies that could benefit from from this uh this decline in the Nodex. Thank you. Um uh, do you mind take over the Fuji Xerox the 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 CDL uh, issue? Thanks. Yeah. Uh let me find the question. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Fuji Xerox question, a uh, recent collapse of the structural wall at Fuji Xerox, which is now uh, they're going to rename it to the new port residences. What is the short midterm impact on CDL? Yeah, so because of this, uh, they will have to drop the construction. They will probably put it on hold and they'll delay the whole situation. And the, uh, last year, I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, last year, because of a lot of this uh, low manpower, then um, that uh, the government came down all these construction rules. So uh, construction was tight and because, because there were many workplace there, so the government implemented a lot of uh, additional rules and, and all, all these things, which is why the construction of uh, started, uh, the cost increase and um, how to put it, uh, that there were more rules and regulations to follow, which was, uh, which was why a lot of the construction was delayed as well. So this will, this will probably just de delay the launch of uh, 
CDL. Um, but um, other than that, the mid and long term impact. Uh, yeah, I can't really think of anything. Just that it, the the project will will be delayed. Uh. Yeah, but it's really unfortunate that that it happened. Yeah, and also if they got anything to add for that on the construction part on general. Uh, but one thing confirm is the the work site will be work at the work site will be stopped and then and then the now that we are in this mandated uh, heightened uh, work site safety issue, uh, the 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 contractors will also get into trouble. Uh, the the directors of the contractors. So the the whole thing will be delayed, which is uh, um for for CDR of course because the uh, Fuji Xerox that building is already sitting on is a uh, on a very low cost uh, project. They they already over the years depreciated uh, it to very low value. So so they their holding cost is low, but definitely no good for the for the uh, perception and. Might, might affect some bias sentiment as well in, on this project. But I, otherwise, we think that uh, uh, in, in terms of PNL impact to, to CDL in the near term, it's probably very, very small. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. Okay, uh, I answer this question on uh, Keppel. Uh, dear Peggy, what are your thoughts on Keppel's EAAS new? Business model in Thailand will it be capital intensive in this ven joint venture? New target value for capital? Uh, no, it's, it's that I believe the joint venture is going to be uh, somewhat uh, place a capital's effective stake at below fifty percent. So they will never, they will not need to um, do any uh, account for this in terms of capex spend or or uh, in terms of. Uh, Property, plant, and equipment. So there will be minimum impact to the to the uh, cash flow, and it will be held under a JV where uh, I think the construction cost will be parked on the JV on the JV level with the uh, with a partner in in the installation process. So we we don't think it will be capital intensive for for capital, but of course uh, as EEAS. Uh, if if they roll up in other parts of in, in other parts of the uh, like in Singapore with a different structure, then 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 we have to reevaluate the, the business model again. And we, we have not changed our target price for capital. It's still seven dollar and six cents. Uh, and unless we we because a, a lot of the capital's value is trapped is actually uh, packed to their property valuation. Property is accounts for about 60, 65% of the total um, value of the uh, sum of parts value for capital. So un unless we see a valuation increase for the property side, and the properties exposure is mainly Vietnam and China. Uh, otherwise, uh, there, there's, there's very little room to raise the capital target price. Thank you. I hope I answered that question. Thanks. The next question, uh, with $10,000 spare cash, oh, so good. Would you buy Dunting or CLAS, uh, which is uh, after land escorts? Uh, I, I think Darren, might, maybe you want to help later on, uh, jump in. But comparing the two, I don't see any reason to buy Dunting. If you like the, the gaming story, the, the casino story, there, there are a lot of opportunities out, out there. And competition is intensifying with uh, Japan also legalizing this, and potentially the other Asian countries as well. So, so uh, we we think CLAS had a better better uh, opportunities for growth because of the recovery and in the uh, travel and and hospitality, and especially as the Chinese stories have not really have not come back uh, in, in a big way yet. Yeah. Okay, I, I think the next one. Um, I'm now staying at the Citadines. I don't know where is this place on. Listening to this webinar. I was in Istanbul three days ago. Wow, so, so envious. There are minimal 
Chinese tourists to be seen in these cities? Are the Chinese tourists really coming back? I think the, the issue here is uh, still for one is the, the visa has not actually been relaxed. Even for Chinese tourists coming to Singapore, they still uh, have to go to get the apply for visa. Our, our, for us going into China, our 15 day free, free visa travel is still not lifted yet. So visa is a, is a problem. And also international flights, for instance, uh, China Eastern, China Eastern's uh, international flights only back to 15% of pre-COVID level. Uh, so so the, the, the flights are not coming back. And most of these airlines, they, they is a B2B, G2G arrangement. That means uh, if I add so many, if I open up so many slots from my place to your place, then you open the same amount of flights back to my place. So, so if China don't, don't fly more, uh, China airlines don't fly more, the correspondingly, the foreign airlines cannot fly so much as much into China. So, so they, are, they cannot resume the, all the capacity. So, so uh, flight capacity is an issue. Second, of course, the, the tourists are really uh, covering the domestic markets like now. Very little demand out for, for, China, for flights out into, for very demand for travel out, uh, out of China into other areas. So I think the uh, might, might take a while to, to come back. And the third thing, of course, we hear about uh, lower consumption in China as uh, uh, the Chinese are uh, probably trying to restrict their, their spending. Uh, in recent months, the civil servants and the, those in the financial sector had a pay cut too. That, that could be the reasons for that. Thank you. Can I leave you to answer this, uh, Darren, for the uh, for the capital group flat question? Thanks. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, the capital group flat uh, question is kind of similar to the the one that <laughs> you said you're staying at a city city teens. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that place. Uh. Yeah, they are minimal tourists. So Peggy said mentioned earlier that the, the tourists of especially from China, they really yet to come back because probably visa issues and the tour groups are not back as well. So it's still slow. We, we I think this will pick up in the second half of this year. Yeah, and uh, uh without Chinese word, how would this affect ART moving forward? Yeah, so uh, currently even without the Chinese tourists, we already see that the ref bar numbers for a lot of countries, especially uh, Singapore, UK, US, already reached pre-COVID levels. Uh, the, the legged is in China and Vietnam for now. So uh, even without Chinese tourists, we really see refund numbers so, so high. And then especially when the, these Chinese tourists come back, uh, we expect the refund to improve further, to, to further add some upside to, to it. And especially when Chinese open the borders, uh, the, the, we expect the ref bar in China and Vietnam to increase as well. So, yeah, it's, it's still a good thing for for the as for escort and hospitality in general because the ref bar numbers uh is is hard to see coming down anytime, uh, perhaps in the in the next year. Yeah, we expect it to to remain or slightly increase going forward. We we understand that the ADRs a lot of it has already reached pre COVID so. The, the upside for AD, the average, average daily rate is not as high as we, because it's a, from, a, from a strong base as well, right? Last year, the, AD, the average daily rates ADRs were already so high. So it's hard to see it improve like a few hundred percent again, like what it did uh, last year. So yeah, but the recovery will be from the occupancy side. Yeah, so, so it's, it's still, still good for hospitality and escort in general. Uh, Yeah, I think uh, there are some questions in the chat as well. I think I'll speak up. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, if you have questions in the, if you have questions, please type it in the Q&A uh, instead, of, instead of the chat. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, but I'll just pick up some questions from the chat. Uh, yeah, Kepo DC, please comment on these talks. 
Yeah, so Kepler TC uh the, the biggest kind of the biggest headwind, I mean not headwind, the biggest uh sentiment that's affecting them right now is definitely the fact that they got removed from the STI. So because of that, a lot of uh, big funds and all the, the listed ETFs, etc., they had to kind of rebalance their portfolio and add Citrum in, into their their uh, portfolio instead and remove Capital DC, especially they are mimicking the STI. So, <clears throat> so of that, there was some outflow for Capital DC. And <clears throat> the other one was, of course, the six Terra bankruptcy. Uh, Capital DC is affected by about uh, less than 2%. They are not as affected as uh, digital core read and <clears throat> paper tree industrial. So, so these are some of the, the, the headwinds going forward for Capital DC. I mean, of course, interest rates, uh, yeah, that is. Uh, affecting all the other reads as well. But yeah, near term, the sentiment of Capital DC is, is hammered by definitely the STI removal and the six Terra bankruptcy. Uh, ESR logos issued their rights lately and since the price came down any upside in the next few months. Uh, yeah, so for ESR, we don't really cover uh, uh, any upside. Yeah, this is, I, I would say again, is the the upside would be from the re-rating re of catalyst, especially if the interest rates go up. So that would be like more of a macro macro upside than a micro upside. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, but ESR logos, uh, we do not cover. And any update on prime share price movement, yeah, I think uh, for that uh, share price movement, I'll probably leave it to Zane to do the technical analysis on that part. Yeah. Thanks, I think I'll hand over the rest of my colleagues first. Yeah, thanks, Darren. Uh, let me take this question first, uh, or one question on the banks. Um, so uh, Adrian asks, for the local banks, say OCBC and UOB, what's a sustainable level of absolute dividends when rates subside? So I think I think you're asking uh, mainly for OCBC and UOB because DBS has come up to say that they would be lifting their ordinary dividends by 24 cents each year. At least for the near term. So, you know, this is about a, a maybe a fifteen to twenty percent increase every year. So they have really done it in twenty twenty two. So twenty twenty three is now at one dollar sixty eight cents, and I think next year they will keep to this minimum of twenty four cents. Um, as for let me just go to the second part where you say when rates subside. So when rates subside, yes, you know they will be, um, they it might look like a like a sort of a bad thing for the banks but actually you know now with the high rates they are quite affected by the slow loans growth you now loans growth is flat almost zero percent for them but NIMS have sort of buffered that and um, like how what is keeping their net profit and their pet me up would be the recovery in fee income as well as the currently the high rates so you know when rates upside you know this will be what will happen is that it will be the inverse of this where loans growth will start to pick up, but you know, their name obviously wouldn't be as strong because of the lower loan or lower rates. And their fee income would also start sort of start to recover, continue to recover when rates start to subside. So I think, you know, I, I don't think it's a question of whether what, what is the sustainable level of dividends, absolute dividends when rates subside, because their net profit will still be expected to improve. So I think they would they definitely have room to continue to increase their absolute, uh, their ordinary dividends. I mean, OCBC and UOB, their CT1, as you know, if you look at DBS as well, their CT1 is way above the their current, their optimal operating range of 12.5 to 13.5%. So OCBC is the highest at 15.9% and UOB is at 14%. So they still definitely have room to increase their uh, dividends and I think they would they should I mean we should we could expect them to increase dividends going forward into the in the near term at least so by maybe they would they might follow suit with what DBS is doing and give a, about a 15 percent around 15 percent increase in ordinary dividends yeah so I, I can't really say what's the absolute dividend level yeah that would be very hard to say thanks
Mm, thanks, Glenn. Uh, I'll take the question on uh, Olam. Okay, the question is, uh, Dear Peggy, what are your thoughts on Olam Agri and OFI IPO? Are you positive with your business model? Will it fetch a good valuation in the general market condition? Uh, if, if we look at closer at Olam's uh, balance sheet, uh, this IPO, they really need the IPO because the the dairy very highly geared and then with the cost of funds rising this is a, a, a very badly hit uh, uh, uh will will negatively affect their their uh, profitability so so the delay uh the ipo for for the the one in uk has been delayed as and in singapore there's also uh, uh, a revival of the plans for IPO or OFI. Um, we we felt is the the market might just uh, heave a sigh of relief if it happened. Uh, more 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 that it will help relieve their their debt burden, but not um, so much of changing the the business model or or the underlying. Uh, um, uh, structure of their operations. Uh, we uh, I not I'm not uh, will will we fetch a good valuation in general market condition? Uh that, but very difficult to to say. Um uh, because the all the commodities prices are have been on the decline lately and um the the kind of products that Olam has are the more into like uh, the, the the more not not the common ones not not like the flour or the wheat that you see it's a it's a almond and so on so so the it's very difficult to to compare like for like if if to 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 you ask me to pick a stock in this sector in a similar space I uh, probably uh, would would lean towards uh Bioma. yeah I I'm sorry I'm not not um that familiar with Olam, but I'll do more work on it, but maybe hopefully the next one I can answer better. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think the next one, uh, uh, is Franken a, a beneficiary of the AI boom or are there any others? I think you call it a beneficiary, it's very, 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 very remote. It's like, like saying, it's like saying I, I become the next president of Singapore. Like, very, it's really very remote here, yeah. So, uh, what we can link it to is the the products that they do as as a uh, chip related that might actually have uh some exposure ultimately go into some kind of uh a device that that uh that enable AI. So I at the moment I I cannot think of any others that in the Singapore listed companies that are direct beneficiary of the AI. Thank you. Um, the next one is uh, what is your view for Yang Zijiang? Uh, I believe you are asking about the ship. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, the the Yang Zijiang ship. The order books are fair. Order books are record high. Uh, we haven't heard any new orders for the last two three months. Um, mainly because they are they are the capacity is quite full. Also, another thing is that uh. The freight rates are coming down, so container uh vessels owners are probably uh, holding back, um, thinking whether they is still profitable for them to order new vessels. And then when three, three four years down the road, the rates might turn negative for them. And so, so the the we we we, we there's no near term catalyst for the price to move. We feel, and also they had another uh. Area where they uh, venture into, which is the LNG carriers, that too, the uh, LNG prices have also come off. So, so we think the there's no near term catalyst for the share price to perform. Thank you. The the only positive for them is the steel plates prices are also falling. So, had steel plates is uh, one of the major raw materials that you use to construct vessels. Thank you. Um, next one. Sankot Industries have been uptrend for a while now. Any chance to hit further higher prices? I think the the Sankot Industries has 
rising has been rising for two reasons. One is the speculation that they might sell same ways at a very high valuation. Okay, uh, so they are in discussion uh, with possible buyers that like, but uh, Pepper sold their, uh, Pepper acquired 800 Super last year for a total valuation of 350 million. So we don't think the uh, same court should be able to command anything higher than that. So therefore, uh, we are more cautious on, on that news. The other thing is the USEP, the Singapore Wholesale Energy Prices, Unified Singapore Energy Price, is the wholesale price which the Samco industry and Keppel sell uh, in, uh, to their customers. That price hit a record, spiked up in May uh, because the, of the sudden surge in uh, energy demand in Singapore and the reserve ratio actually uh, dropped for the, our power generation. So, so th there was some optimism that uh, on this, on the, the margin will, the spread will, will uh, increase uh, co comparing that, uh, considering that their, their cost is natural gas, natural gas prices are falling and yet USEP is, is, uh, has spiked again. So, so but with, uh, this, this spike is probably going to be temporary uh, and, and so the, just a one month spike, we, we don't, we uh, really don't do this to use this to revise up, revise our numbers. And same course, uh, uh, the earnings are still, uh, uh, we, we still pack the valuation based to the renewable players uh, listed out there, those in India and Europe. So they are still trading about 11 times uh, uh, PE. Therefore, we, our target price is $5 in one sense. Uh, but we five dollars and six cents. But we 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 think there could be uh, uh, room to revise upwards if we see if we uh, we they are going to set up uh, come up with new targets for the renewable energy capacity. They had already hit the targets that they wanted. They set for twenty twenty five. They already ten ten uh, gigawatt. They already meet hit that. They already at eleven. So they're coming out with a new target. So with that new target, then we can formulate our new uh, valuation for same core industry. So there's room for us to revise our, our target price upwards. But at the moment, because we, we haven't seen that target number, uh, uh, we don't we we can't actually uh, move move our numbers yet. Yeah, I hope I answer that question. Okay, what is your view venture short term? Uh, this this question should be for Paul, but it's it's uh, uh, He's drinking Thai milk tea now, I think. Okay, the, the, the electronics players are likely to see a weak second quarter, we, we believe, uh, across the board for all the other rest, not just venture alone, because of the weak, weak uh, orders and the uh, go even flowing into the quarter. Uh, we, the only upturn in orders and in, in output will probably be in fourth quarter this year. So the not, we're not, uh, Paul last week was, was still bearish on, on venture. Thank you. Darren, uh, would you take this CLI, CLAR, and MIT question, please? Yeah, so uh, does this question didn't really specify whether it's a TA or not? So I'll just leave it there. This is a TA question. Yeah, but for fundamentals of CLI, I think mentioned earlier, yeah, they're still affected by the interest rates and the full impact will be felt perhaps in next year or, or two. So that there are headwinds there. But CLI, their, their model is uh, not as lumpy as CBL because they do not have the development arm anymore. They are, they're more, more, they're still more of, of like a fund management arm rather now with a lot of fee income and all their funds under management and their, their list of stakes in their relative REITs. Yeah, we, we have a target price of 4 cal for, for CLI right now. Uh, for CLAR and Maple Street Industrial, uh, both of them recently, they had a private placement. And yeah, because of that, their, their share price kind of got, got hit. Uh, yeah, but the, I mean, the good thing is that at least uh, there are some, uh, is they, they did the placement for acquisitions. So which means that uh, the market for all these acquisitions, inorganic growth is slowly coming back. 
So that is a, a good thing that I can see from uh, CLA right, and Maple Street Industrial. I mean, uh, I mean for the REITs in general, uh, because as you all know, the 2022, that there weren't many transactions and there weren't many uh, acquisitions in, in the REIT market. So uh, of course, uh, with this uh, uh, CLAR placement and acquisition, this will help CLI as well, because uh, CLI will earn from this uh, event-driven income. Yeah, but for CLAR and Maple Street Industry, we do not cover. Yes, I'll leave the question there in case it was a TA question. I hope that answered for the fundamental portion. Okay, thanks, thanks, Darren. I'll, I'll take the, the few that we, I missed out. I'm so sorry about this. Uh, the, I think this is the, sorry, okay. There's a question on uh, from Mike. Uh, challenges, offer price acceptable or reasonable? Please advise. Uh, uh, difficult to say whether it's acceptable or reasonable, uh, but I think it's, it's going to be a, probably going to be a done deal anyway, because the, the owners already own so much uh, big percentage in, in the company, and this is the second time second uh, time they try. So, uh, yeah, uh, even if I, even if we feel it's not acceptable, it will still be probably uh, 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 carry out. I, I, I believe, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I can't add any value to this. Thanks. Uh, is there's a good question. Uh, is Delphi a good stock to hold for dividends? Um, is uh, the shareholders own a lot of shares, the major shareholders? Definitely, I think they will like dividend for themselves. Uh, but this Delphi, uh, I have always, uh, my, my biggest, uh, the biggest thing in the in the numbers is usually uh, because of the rupiah and US dollar uh, exchange rates fluctuation. Because they bought, they buy their coffee, uh, they, they buy their the cocoa powder in US dollar, but they they sell uh, a lot in a lot of the costs are in other costs are in rupiah, and also they sell in the uh, the Indonesian market is the main market. They sell a lot that in, in also rupiah. So so the Currency is a play a big part in the profit numbers. So the I noticed that the rupiah has again um, weakened against the US dollar uh, in in the last one month. So uh, this one thing to caution. Uh, and, and first quarter they reported a very good first quarter. That's because also first quarter is typically a good quarter. And this time, this year, uh, we had the lembaran also in the first quarter. So this uh. Valentine's Day and the brand, typically uh, a lot of chocolates, a lot of uh, uh, chocolates are being uh, purchased during this period. So the uh, if you want to hold Delphi for long term, you have to be prepared for for a currency uh, movements. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, that, that's that's all I can comment. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, I think that's the last question on Sam. Uh, a quick question is same called Peggy. Further on SCI, seems it has a lot of capital into invest. Will it need EFR going forward or is capital recycling will do the job? The, I think the, a lot of the renewable energy investments, uh, especially those overseas, will be we will take they will take a small stakes. They will not they will not be a, a majority owner. So the, the renewable projects are are okay. Uh, the the plants in Singapore, the coal gem plants and so on. Apparently, of course, the the price, the cost of investing in new plants has has uh, has uh, increased. Uh, the the EMA has actually also mentioned that if there is no private players coming in to bid for to construct the new plants to increase the capacity in Singapore, then uh, EMA might come in and and help right, or take take the be, become the owner of these plants as well. So I think there's some room for for uh, maneuver over there. Uh, the the thing we want to watch for SCI is that we told, they saw them into the India power plants. They didn't get paid for it. They they received something called a deferred payment notes. So they are uh, collecting interest on those notes. I mean they they accrue interest on those notes. Whether they collect or not is also a, 
uh, whether the, the buyer of the plant uh, has the capacity, is in the is it had the has the ability to pay them. So so that is the is that proceeds from the sale of that the Indian plant that we, we are watching. So if if we are, if the, the the so most of the cash is trapped in there. So if they are able to receive the proceeds, then then there's no we don't see any need for EFR. Uh, uh, yeah. So the the other sector recycling will be from the sale of the China properties, uh, uh, from the property uh, holdings in Vietnam. The we don't see a need for them to do an EFR at the moment. But the, if if the those projects that they have sold, they're not able to collect in terms of cash flows, then maybe there's a the EFR will be required uh, uh, for, for SEI. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, is Singtel a good dividend stock? Uh, it is a it is a dividend stock, but the word good I uh not not sure uh how how to qualify that because the the a lot of their value actually does comes from their uh, associates level or their you know, investments in the different associates uh, uh then associates you know uh, the the cash flow from associates coming from via dividend so via the the dividend from these associates. So they, they need to, uh, provided that the associates are, are paying back the dividend back to Singtel. So, so it's, it's, telcos are typically a dividend place for, uh, for good reason, because they are supposed to be a utility. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I probably didn't answer your question properly. Uh, sorry, I'll speak about that. Okay, Peggy, what's your view on Food Empire? Good for keep for dividend play. Um, I think it's again, uh, yeah, a dividend. If you are keeping it for dividend, yes. But the uh, the the core business uh is determined a lot by the, the exposure in India for 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 ingredients. They, they produce uh they started to produce ingredients from the Indian plant, and also in Vietnam, where they they, they also uh don't. Uh, Going in a big way, but the the so is a we, we for food empire we not just have to look into the the uh Kazakhstan the the Tajikistan the the, the, the former Russian uh, 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 countries we we also uh, the increasingly the a lot of their exposure are in the Southeast Asia and in Asia India and in Vietnam uh, Vietnam uh. We we the to, as you might know the the market is soft uh, because of the uh, crime down on corruption last year so they're still uh, find trying to find its feet up for for the economy and they also have a power issue uh, for the country so the is is food empire will be good as a good as a dividend play but the I mean um uh, why is I I'm not too sure. Uh, we, we will be using the plan in the next one. I hope to give you a better picture after that. Thank you. Um, Derek, would you like to take the last question on any likelihood of listed property developers prioritizing? Thanks. Yeah, so uh, for that question, any likelihood of listed property developers prioritizing due to the soft property market now? I don't see any uh, of that happening i think it's, it's speculation now but for the bigger players maybe not but the small players uh, uh i think there's a higher chance but I, uh, it's just speculation for me i'm not sure if they got anything right for that but yeah i don't see that happening for the bigger players for sure like the, the cdl ul all these uh, perhaps maybe for the smaller players as they lose out on the market share yeah yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think so. Is is it quite, uh, the with the cost of funds coming up, the privatization, the cost of privatization is also very, getting very expensive. Yeah, so the it's, it's not not likely for 
for them to want to pursue this route. Especially property developers now they require a lot more cash flows to to um for, for new projects. Uh, the, uh, the the land cost has gone up and they, they need to the the funding uh is the credit credit uh available is also tightening. So therefore I don't we don't see any likelihood for that to happen. Thank you. Um, with that, I maybe can. Uh, this. Uh, yeah, thanks, Pei. I think uh, there's one question on Prime. Uh, yeah, okay. Is Prime still giving out good dividend? The price is quite low. Any other reasons that this price will still go down? Yeah, so, any other reasons the price will still go down? That one is yes, a bit hard to say because we all know that what's happening in the US commercial market is quite challenging. Um, But based on valuations, they're trading at, at this price at 20 cents. is. Uh, the, the book value is like 74 cents, so they're trading at like 0 0.3 times book or even lower than that. Uh, dividend wise, the FY22 dividends, if you count that based on current share price, is also upwards of 25%. So, I mean, we understand that uh, there might be slightly higher vacancies, but uh, due to tenant movement, but we think the uh, occupancy for Prime will remain above 85%. So uh, if you ask me, is Prime still giving out good dividends uh, based on current share price, even if the dividends for FI23 goes down by perhaps 20%, uh, we're, we're still seeing a 20% uh, high teens or even higher uh, percentage of dividends for Prime based on current share price. So, so yes, I think there is some, some uh, good value there. But... Uh, Maybe the key part, uh, Zane can add some insight, but other than that, we, we understand there are some headwinds, which is why the price is, is so uh, trading so low. Yeah, but value wise, yes, it's, it's, it is a good pick. And I think that's all. Uh, I'm not sure whether Zane wants to start uh, picking up the TA or. Uh, sure, I think we can start. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me just share my screen right now. Okay, I see uh, there's uh, some questions in the chat. Uh, so I'll just address some of them first. Uh, there's a question from Freddie. What's your forecast of US stocks going forward? Okay, I think when we look at the index-wise, I think we could be seeing possibly uh, some sort of uh, retracement soon. And look at S&P 500, uh, it's quite near the uptrend channel resistance near 4,005 over here. So probably about maybe 100 points away. Uh, then when you look at uh, NASDAQ, NASDAQ, we actually, we actually hit the, this uptrend channel resistance uh, last Friday and we saw a little bit of a, uh, some uh, profit taking over here possibly. And also uh, this is also confirmed with a 61.8% retracement Fibonacci retracement level from the all-time highs to the October lows last year. So at this point, there could be some uh, retracement taking place. Yeah. Then when you look at like the fear and greed index as well, uh, it's currently at 82 extreme greed. Uh, when you look at uh, at these uh, stretch levels, which was back in uh, February this year, we saw a little bit of a pullback in the market. So uh, my view is that we could see a little bit of a back in the US market soon. Yeah. Okay, then for the other questions like um uh capital DC as well as Alibaba, I'll cover it together with the other TA questions okay in the QA. Okay, then now I'll start on the, the questions in the QA. Uh what's your take on Delphi CFMAC as well as Thai beverage in three months time? Okay, for Delphi, I think for now, I would think that uh, we could see a little bit of a consolidation taking place. Uh, for the uptrend-wise, we recently we saw uh, this higher low at around 134 being broken down. So for the meantime, I think we are still seeing some support around 123, this swing over here. With that, I think price could do a little bit of a range uh, sideways consolidation for now. Also, given that we actually broke down a little this uh, uptrend channel uh, in the short term. Yeah, so I would expect Delphi to probably uh, consolidate a range for now and then we see towards um, nearer to September and we see uh, how it goes. Then for CFMAC. 
Okay, for CFMAC, I think the, it's still trending pretty well. Uh, recently, we had this breakout of uh, a consolidation triangle. And then uh, upon the retest of this prior resistance at around the 70 cents mark, we found support and we did a bounce back uh, to try and retest around the 76 cents mark over here. So I think uh, there is a chance for CFMAC to continue to make uh, higher highs in time to come as long as we still find a higher, these lows around the 70 cent mark is being supported. And then uh, we should be able to see higher highs uh, in the next three months. <laughs> then as for Thai beverage, I think recently the stock uh, did, recently a stock did a double bottom around the 54 cents mark. So this was the swing low in October of last year. And then we also break, broke out of this uh, down, short term downtrend resistance line over here. So I expect in the next three months, uh, possibly we could see a little bit of a bounce over here taking place. Uh, some resistance could come in first around the 60 cents mark to about the 61 cents mark over here in the near term. Yeah, so that's my take on uh, Thai Bear Ridge. Okay, then uh, next one will be Apple Corp. Okay, for capital call, I think short term wise, we could have uh, hit a little bit of a resistance based on this uh, trend line over here. So that's around the $7 mark. Uh, but the good thing is still that um, we have a period of a range consolidation over here taking place around the 6, from about 630 to about 6, uh, mid 650s. And then we have breakout. So with that, I think the uptrend is still intact. Um, possibly see, we could see a little bit of a, some retracement over here. Uh, to try and retest this um, previous resistance or try to make a higher low even uh, in the meantime for Capricorn. Yeah. So I think we could see a little bit of a consolidation for now. <clears throat> and then for Hopa, I think for, for, the mean, for the short term wise, I think for now we could see a little bit of a bounce in the share price. Uh, since that uh, these lows around the $9 mark is still holding. And then recently we broke above this uh, short-term downtrend resistance line over here. So if we do hold this price level around 930 over here, which was this uh, support we broke down, then uh, we managed to hold over here. I think we could see the price bound rebound to about 960 to about 980, this uh, short-term resistance re uh, zone over here for Hopa then we probably will trade in this uh, bigger range pattern over here. Okay, next one will be the Agricultural Bank of China. Okay, so for, for this, I think short term wise, uh, the uptrend is uh, being broken for the very short term. Uh, we can see price is actually doing a little bit of a range consolidation for now. The support is uh, near the 290 as well as the $3 mark over here. And some resistance is around the 310 region, and then a uh, high up will be around the three, near 325 over here. So I expect short term wise price will still exp probably still do some little bit of a consolidation for now uh, for this uh, agriculture bank of China. Okay, next, then some of the Hong Kong uh, 3032 is Hang Seng Investment Management Tech ETF. So for this, uh, recently we uh, had a bit of a rebound after breaking out of this downtrend resistance line. But I think that uh, for now, there could be some uh, short-term uh, a little bit of a pullback, given that we actually tried to test this uh, 420 resistance uh, zone over here. Uh, but I do think that uh, should we come down to maybe 390 over here, this resist previous resistance of this range, I think we should be able to hold around here, try to make a higher low and try to do another leg up. Yeah, so now probably just a bit of a rest for the Hong Kong side. Okay, then moving on to Tencent. Tencent also broke out of this downtrend, uh, this pullback channel recently. Uh, have a bit of a bounce. I think we could retest this uh, resistance level around 345. Uh, then we see whether there's some uh, support coming in. If there is, then I think we could uh, possibly continue this, uh, this rebound leg over here to try to hit possibly close to 370 next, yeah. <clears throat> then uh, next one will be jd.com. 
So JD also rebounded recently. Uh, we managed to break above this uh this range over here. So the resistance at around 1.9150 was being broken. And then uh currently we could do a little bit of a retest over here to see whether this holds. And if you do, then I think the next resistance level to look out for is around 160 as well as this 173 over here. And next one is uh, Ping An Insurance. So uh, Ping An, I think, uh, also similar to the other Hong Kong stock rebounding after we tested these lows around the fifty dollar mark. Uh, doing a, looks like doing a little bit of a sideways pattern over here. So I think that will probably continue for now. And if you do see a little breakout of these fifty four dollar highs, then I think we could see the next. Uh, it has the next level of resistance, possibly closer to fifty six. Uh, then $58 for Ping An. Okay, then for Alibaba. Okay, Alibaba uh, also recently rebounded after the support, we test the support near 78. Uh, then we are, we retested the swing high around the 89 over here, as well as this, um, this trend line over here. This previous uptrend support line that was being broken over here. So at this at this area, we can expect some sort of a uh, little bit of a resistance pullback. I think uh, should we retest this uh this short term resistance that broke off near eighty four? Uh, we could see some support over here. Then, if it holds, then we could see another leg up for for Alibaba. Okay, then I'll move on to the three local banks. For DBS, I think recently nothing much. We can see. The support, the key support around the thirty dollars fifty cent mark is still holding. Then after that, we did a rebound. Uh, currently just holding in this range over here, so nothing much for DBS. Yeah, so I will expect this range to actually continue. Then short term resistance wise, will likely be be this uh swing highs near uh thirty one fifty to about thirty one eighty over here. And next, I'll cover uh OCBC. OCBC looking uh. A bit better than uh, the rest. The good thing is that it actually looks like there was a this there was a breakout of this range over here that's been taking place for some time. So if we manage to hold around the twelve, this twelve forty level over here, uh, I think possibly we could see OCBC trying to test this uh these highs around the twelve seventy to about twelve eighty level. Mm. The next one is uh, UOB. UOB is a bit similar to DBS. Uh, nothing much going on. So just still start in this range over here. The resistance still at around the 2850 mark. Uh, support is, should be coming in closer to uh, about the 2760 to about 2770 level where we have this uh, trend line support over here as well as the recent these swing lows over here. Yeah. So in terms of chart wise, you can see that DBS and UOB are a bit more similar a bit range trading for now, but uh, OCBC a bit stronger uh, recently. Okay, next up will be Venture. Okay, for Venture, recently uh, showing a bit of a strength after we had this breakout of this uh, downtrend resistance line, as far as breakout of this recent highs around the 1550 mark. Then I think for now, short term, we could uh, we could see some resistance closer to about uh 1650, I guess, which is I don't know if we do retest uh this uptrend support line breakdown over here. And then previously we had some uh swing lows around here as well. So at this point there could be some resistance, but short term support could come in from around, around 1550 over here because this resistance already broke out. Yeah, so let's see how it goes if. It forms a higher low over here, then I think that we could see continuation of the, the upside momentum in the short term. And next will be uh, UMS. Okay, UMS recently uh, looking a bit better. So we had a breakout of this uh, downtrend, downtrend channel over here, uh, but it's still testing the 109, 110 uh, short term resistance over here. We still continue to have resistance. Uh, but the good thing is that it looks like we are seeing uh, higher lows taking place over here. So that's a bit of a moody signal. 
uh, there's a chance that we, we, we could break out of this level, then we could test possibly uh, around 113, 114 next, which is this previous swing low as well as this swing high over here. Okay, next one is uh, Jardine C and C. If for Jardine, I think nothing much for now. Uh, looks like we can see it's a range for now. So I expect that to continue. Uh, from the resistance is around 34, 40 over here. Yeah. Um, then support is closer. The strong support is around 32 over here. Yeah. So should we do a break? If we do a breakout of this level, then I think we could see uh around 35, 60 next for Jardine. Uh, if not, then we just continue to, to, to stay in this range for now. And next is a dairy farm. A uh, dairy farm, I think we keep testing the, the, the key support around the 277 over here. Uh, that thing, and then one thing to know is we have been making lower highs into the support. So we can see uh, first time there was a bounce, bounce to about 323, the next bounce was lower around 311. Then recently there was a retest and a small little bounce over here around 3285. So with the lower highs into the support, if you do break, there's a chance that we could break this support. Uh, if you do breach this 277 level, then the next support could be closer to about 258, uh, 260 over here for DFI. Okay, then Hong Kong land next. Uh, Hong Kong land a bit bearish recently also. So we broke below this swing low of 415 as well as this um this uptrend support line. So with that, I think we could see maybe price going a little bit lower to try to maybe retest close to 395 over here, which was a previous uh horizontal level over here for Hong Kong land. Okay, next is uh city developments. City developments recently, <clears throat> I think a little bit of a range uh, uh bound pattern over here. Uh, support was found around close to six seventy. Still resistance upon the retest of the recent highs at around uh seven seventeen. So I think for now range will likely continue, and then we see a breakout of these highs. Then we could test around seven thirty next for or city development. Okay, next up is um Franklin. Okay, Franklin, uh this similar to UMS, we match a breakout of this uh down a downtrend resistance line. Then we are testing uh, uh some resistance around 94 cents, which was this previous uh, swing low and this swing high over here. So uh, for now, I expect some resistance, possibly could see some, a little bit of a pullback, then we could see whether it forms a higher low. Uh, for another link up, yeah. Then next for AEM. Okay, AEM quite strong recently. We managed to break out this uh seven three sorry, $3.70 a horizontal level. <laughs> then we actually managed to test uh another swing high last time close to about 390 over here which was previously uh, quite a strong support level as well. Yeah, so if you do, uh, for now, we, there could be some, a little bit of resistance coming in at these levels, but if you do see continuation of bullish momentum, then I think there's a chance that price could still go higher to try and test 410 over here, which was another swing hunt. Yeah, but if this level cannot hold, then we could see a little bit of pullback over here for EEM. Okay, then uh, China Aviation. Hmm. China Aviation looking good recently, broke out of this uh, downtrend resistance line. Then we tested the swing high, this key swing high as well as the previous uh, key support around the 99 cent level. So at this level, I think we could see a little bit of a, uh, some uh, retracement or, or some range trading for now. Yeah, then we see how it goes for, for China Aviation.
Okay, then next is uh, first resources. First resources, hmm, looks like we're trying to attempt a breakout of this 150 resistance. Uh, and recently we did a retest, uh, then managed to go back up again. So it looks like could be a little bit of a range over here. Uh, but I think there's a chance of a breakout if we do hold this, this recent swing goes over here at around 147. Yeah, then I think possibly if that happens, then uh we could see closer to 160 if we manage to break out the recent highs near 155 over here. So that's it for first resources. Okay, then uh, let me see what's the next one. <clears throat> The next one is a uh, best world. So I think best world we could see a little bit of a rebound uh recently. So it looks like we are out of this downtrend ch uh, channel over here. <coughs> uh then after that, uh we also retested this previous uh resistance around 182 over here. So with that uh if we manage to hold these lows around the one 176, right? And I think we could see a little bit of rebound taking place for best world. Yeah. Okay, next is uh C Trump. <clears throat> uh C Trump looks like we tested this 133 uh swing high over here. Uh, but the good thing is that we managed to break out this uh, downtrend pullback channel over here. So, uh, for now, I think uptrend is still a rebound. Uptrend wave is still okay. Uh, just that we could see a little bit of a pullback retracement over here for now. Yeah. Okay, then for uh digital call read. Uh, just excuse me for a moment. I think I'll just drink some uh, water first. Okay, uh, okay, I'm back. Uh, so for digital query, I think, um, we tested around the 4, 48 cents mark over here, uh, which was this swing high back in April this year. So there's some bit of resistance taking place over here. Uh, so with that, I think we could see a little bit of range trading as well as consolidation. Uh, then we see whether this um this breakout of the 43 and a half cents mark is able to hold. And then we then if this holds, then we I think we could see some uh some the up the recent uh, rebound wave continuing. Yeah. Okay, the next one is uh, Yang Zijiang Shipbuilding. Okay, for Yang Zijiang Shipbuilding, I think currently we are testing uh, some resistance, uh, a resistance zone around 130 to about 132. You can see uh, this was a previous support uh, back in December of last year. Then it turned into resist a swing high resistance February this year. And currently, we are seeing some resistance over here also. Uh, so we need to see whether if we manage to break out this resistance, then the next, <clears throat> next resistance will be around 134, uh, which was the previous this range high of December last year as well. So, uh, possibly this uh, trend line resistance over here. But the good thing is that over here, you can see that when you test the 130 mark, uh, higher lows have been formed. And previously, it was 121, then uh, it became 126. So you can continue to form higher a uh, higher low over here. Then that could be positive for a uh, continuation of recent uh, uptrend over here. Oh, yeah, okay, then next one is a uh, capital land invest. On Capital Invest, I think uh, the chart wise is a bit similar to Thai Beverage. Recently, just also formed a double bottom over here at uh, around 327. And then uh, for CLI, recently looking good because we broke above this, this range resistance from about uh, 336 to about 340. So 
if this is able to hold, I think we could see further after and we try and retest about uh 350, about 350 next. Yeah, for CLF. Okay, then let's get a question on the TA for uh STI. So for STI, I think uh currently we could see a little bit of a, re a resistance based on this uh purple trend line we see over here. So we have been re finding resistance along this trend line since uh since the start of this year. So with that uh with the uh, that's around three two seven three thousand two hundred seventy points level. Uh, this was also a previous like uh a range support over here previously. So at this point, you could see a little bit of resistance coming in for STI. Uh, could see a little bit of a retracement back to try and maybe retest uh, 3,220 over here, which was this level that we broke out of. Yeah. So short term wise, could see a little bit of a pullback and consolidation for the STI. Okay. Let's see. Next one will be uh, Thai Bear Bridge. Okay, for Thai beverage recently, okay, I think I covered covered this earlier. <clears throat> okay, uh, I will try to speak a bit louder. Yeah, for BC2. Okay, next one is um Olam. So Olam recently also did a double bottom at 137 over here. Then it looks like we found some support. You can see price. Uh, the downtrend over here has uh stopped, and we we did a little bit of a range over here. So I think that should probably continue for now. The near term resistance is around one forty eight over here. Then uh higher up we could see resistance probably at one fifty two, which is this uh previous support term resistance as well as this downtrend resistance line over here. And then uh C fifty two is uh comfort del growth. Okay, comfort Del Grow recently um rebounded. Okay, then uh, but some resistance could be in, in the uh inside uh, around one about one uh seventeen. This level was a previous uh res strong resistance over here. So I think it should price come that come to this level. There could be some uh resistance taking place for comfort Del Grow. And uh, next one is capital D series. Okay, for capital D series, I think the main we are actually we actually broke down this main uptrend channel over here. Uh, price has been finding some support on retest of this horizontal level near two dollars here, so the psychological level. But uh, for now, looks a little bit bearish. Since we broke down this main uptrend channel, and then uh we can see price is actually trending downwards over here. So for now, resistance I think could be around 208 to about 213 over here. This this range. Yeah. So if we cannot recover back above this this zone, I think we could see some continuation of the downtrend momentum uh, for capital DC. Okay, next one is uh, LHN. <clears throat> okay, for LHN, I think um, you can see it's a bit of a range over here around the 34 cents mark to about 37 and a half cents mark. Yeah, so I think we could continue this range over here and see how it goes next. Uh, previously around the 37 and a half to about 38 cents, uh, this was a swing high resistance. Yeah, so I think if we could break that. Could break above this uh resistance, then there's a chance we could hit above closer to 40 cents to about 42 cents uh for the next uh resistance for average and should we have a successful breakout. Okay, then next one is uh prime US read. Okay, for prime, I think um the price didn't manage to hold above this uh downtrend, this downtrend channel over here. I can see price is actually just trending sideways for now. So I think uh looks like it's range trading. The support is close to about uh there's support around the 19, close to 19 and a half, 19.3 cents over here. Then resistance, some resistance around uh 20, 22 and a half cents to about 
uh, 25 cents. So I think probably range trading will still continue for prime in the near term. And then for Capital Pacific Oak, uh, recently it looks like we could be we could broke out of this, could have broken out of this falling wedge pattern over here with this downtrend resistance sign. Um, but price you can see still trading sideways over here. But, uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, as long as it doesn't breach below this this recent swing low around 29 and a half cents, I think that could be some positive to try and retest. Uh, this recent swing high around 34 cents uh, with a near term resistance for Kappa Pacific. Okay, then what's my view on hourglass technical? Okay, for hourglass, I think looks like a bit bearish for now. Uh, reason being, we could be in this uh downtrend channel for now, as well as uh, we actually broke below this two o seven uh this range support recently, and that has turned into a resistance over here. So with that, uh, I think price could trade maybe lower. Uh, currently resistance would be around two o five uh number. Uh, then some support is around one. The support is around one ninety four. This swing over here, yeah. Then, uh, next question, do you prefer SIA or SES? Okay, I'll answer the PA one. Okay, for SIA, I think right now it's quite high. Uh, looking at the big picture-wise, there's this um, uptrend channel over here, and we're actually above it, so actually quite overextend, a bit overextended for now. Then uh, in terms of resistance levels, the next one, the next key one is around 8, 10, I think. So, uh, this is quite a while back. If I look at the weekly chart, um, this was a, a swing high resistance back in 2010 over here. So uh, for now, I would think that SIE is quite overextended. I wouldn't get into it now. Then uh, comparing to sets-wise, <clears throat> sets-wise, I think uh, price is actually just trading in a range over here. So uh, currently price is around 274, then there's a resistance, the next key resistance is closer to about the high end of 280, about 287 to about 290. So uh, probably maybe another, uh, also less than 20 cents of upside over here in terms of technicals for now. So uh, also not much upside if you think this is a range over here, yeah. So. Or not, maybe it's better to wait for a little bit of a retracement, I guess, for these two. Okay, what's the take profit price for Tesla? Tesla has been climbing the last few weeks. Okay, let me just load out the chart. Okay, in terms of Tesla, I think uh, we actually retested a this uh possible resistance level closer to uh the mid 260s this was a previous uh swing low support bank in uh, august september last year uh should price keep going out i think the next a uh, key resistance will possibly be closer to the 290 level so over here there was some uh previous supports over here as a key horizontal level then also we have this uh, downtrend resistance line over here, which has acted uh, about three times over here. So I think um, this could be maybe a possible take profit level if uh, price comes to this level for Tesla, in my opinion. Okay, then uh, there's a question on uh, Jutian chemical. So for Jutian, I think, Currently, there could be some still, there could still be some uh, resistance around the 5.8 cents mark over here. <clears throat> so this was a recent swing high as well as uh, this, uh, this support level that we actually broke down off. Then uh, there's also this, uh, this downtrend line resistance also acting on it. So there's quite a couple of resistances at this level. So uh, let's see, uh, price should 
could face some resistance over here, but if it does a breakout, then I think uh that the price could maybe uh try to reach uh on six six point four cents about six point five cents over here. Yeah, then uh if it fails based on the three resistances over here, then I think maybe it will revert back to this range over here, then find support closer to about 5.4 cents over here. <clears throat> okay, then Yoma strategic. Okay, Yoma, I think uh, recently we tested uh, this swing low around the nine cents mark over here. So then, uh, price looks like from the daily chart wise, it looks like this. Uh, try to double bottom form over here in the short term, at the eight point eight cents mark, and then we did a rebound. So for now, I think we could see some sort of rebound as long as this around the nine cents level holds. Then maybe you try to retest closer to nine point seven to nine point eight cents. Which was this support that was being broken as well? We have this um downtrend resistance sign over here. Okay, then for um IX Bio Pharma. Okay, IX Bio Pharma, I think we just looks like uh is trading in the range following a very big downtrend over here. So I think that will probably continue. Resistance close to the 10, uh, 10 cents mark. Then some the strong support is around the 8 cents over here. Yeah. So that's for it for now, I think, for IX Bio Pharma. Okay, then Inotech. Okay, for Inotech, I think we are trading in a, this big range pattern over here. For, so the upper end of resistance closer to about 48 cents to about the 51 cents level, then strong support is coming in around uh, 36 and a half cents to about 39 cents over here. So I think for now, price could be trending uh, lower since that we, in this stretch, we actually broke below the 45 cents uh, this, uh, this range support recently. So Price could trend possibly lower to try and retest maybe uh 41 cents first, then uh yeah, to see whether you can find some support. Uh if not, we could see maybe closer to 38 cents uh next. Okay, then there's another some questions on uh Mac. Met text as well as uh, Sing Xiong. Okay, for Met text, I think we had a pullback down to close to the 50% Fibonacci retracement level around 15 cents over here. Uh, then price again try to range uh, over here. So I think if the support at uh fourteen and a half fourteen point seven cents still holds. Then, uh, we could transfer and see whether there's a breakout of fifteen point three cents over here. Uh, which was a previous support level that was being broken to try and reclaim back. Uh, to try and reverse the downtrend. Uh. yeah. So we must see this support hold and, uh, try to see whether, uh, there's a chance of breaking of fifteen point three cents to try and hit maybe sixteen point five cents for some reason. Uh, the next resistance level. Okay, then for Sing Xiong, uh, I think we hit some support recently. So uh, there's this um, main uptrend support line. We actually found some pounds upon the retest at around 160, 181. Then uh, looks like we are trying we also going trying to go back above one sixty four. This um this horizontal previous uh horizontal resistance also. So I think as long as we can try to form a higher low over here, then I think price could go back try to do a short short term rebound with some resistance 
then uh near term resistance probably around 170 to 171 this uh this level over here which was like a support we broke down the entire resistance over here Okay, then Raffles Medical. Raffles Medical, I think <clears throat> uh, we broke below this. Um, there's this uptrend channel, uh, sorry, uptrend support line, but then uh, we currently still find support around 130, which is this swing lows over here. Yeah. Then, but uh, let's see whether we're still able to hold. If not, the next support level will be around 127 over here. And for Freezer's hospitality. Freezer's hospitality, I think, uh, currently looks like nothing much going on. Still in a range. Still in a range uh, <clears throat> pattern over here. Yeah. So that, I think we'll expect that will continue. Support is probably around 40, possibly the 45 cents to about 46 cents zone over here. Then resistance is upwards from about 48 and a half cents to about. Uh, for nine cents for a time being, yeah. But I think I cover the two last questions on Tuan Singh as well as Alibaba. Uh, then I pass on my time to the rest of my colleagues. Uh, for Tuan Singh, currently I think it looks like a big range pattern over here, so. I think could find some support close to 30 cents over here through this uh, swing low as well as this recent swing low hole. Yeah, then for now could be forming a range uh, since it actually uh, came back down from about 37 cents over here. And for Alibaba ADR, Uh, recently, there's a breakout of this downtrend resistance line. Then uh, we also went above this uh, swing high around the $91. But then um, for now, there could be some resistance acting on it based on this previous support and $94. That could add a survey of resistance. So with that, we could possibly see some uh, pullback to maybe retest this um, this uh, recent resistance that we broke out from about 88 to about 91. Then we see whether there's a higher low being formed for this, uh, this rebound stretch to actually continue. Yeah, so I think that's all for me today for TA. Uh, I'll pass on my time to the rest of my colleagues for some, for the other FA portions. Thanks, yeah, I think the question on do you prefer SQ or sets? Uh, fundamentally wise, fundamental wise. The SQ uh, we have argued that uh, it's overpriced compared to the regional carriers like CX, uh, China Eastern, all the all the rest are trading at lower EV beta compared to set SQ. And uh, on top of that, uh the, the EBITDA for this uh CX and, and, and those uh, the other regional allies, the, the EBITDA are rising because uh, the reopening of their uh, borders uh, was later. So there's room for them to improve on their EBITDA. But for SQ, the, the uh, EBITDA growth going forward could be limited right? because they already had uh, uh, up to 80% of their capacity pre-COVID. And uh, uh, the, the, the room to grow their capacity will be uh, smaller going forward. So, and we also think that when CX and the rest starts to put in more flights, the airfare should come down. So that will impact on the, the passenger use for Singapore, Singapore Airlines. So we, the only positive for Singapore Airlines is the declining jet fuel prices, which also helps the rest of the competitors. So, so it's, uh, uh, it's uh, equal for all. So we, uh, we, we have not initiated coverage on SQ should be in the next couple of days. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we caution on the valuation of SQ right now. 
what sets uh, uh, the, the cargo contribution will come in from April this quarter. It's two quarters, so the uh, numbers don't look exciting. And on top of that, uh, the debt level, the, the borrowings will go up for sets with the consolidation of WFS. So we uh, we're keeping on keeping to our target price. Uh, we think compared to two, uh, the market might have already um, uh, factored in uh, the, the the outlook for sets, but it's still too bullish for for SQ. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's a question on Hourglass. I just the last time I met Hourglass was like a year back. So I I'm not maybe not very fair for me to comment, but just fundamentally, Hourglass uh, is very uh, good to the tourist arrivals. Uh, in Singapore, uh, Chinese uh, customers uh, are very big uh, for them, for watches and jewelries in Singapore. And uh, you, you notice our first four, four months of this year, our retail sales for watches and jewelries have been uh, declining year on year. Uh, that's for Singapore. Then for our class also, they own properties in Australia and in, in New Zealand. They had a slight write-off in the value of these assets. In the last financial year, ended March last year. I think there should be more to provide for, especially as uh, Australia's uh, uh, the commercial markets, commercial property market looks uh, 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 weaker after the the rate hikes. So the uh, we we think the euphoria after the reopening of the Singapore economy, the the rush into buying. The uh, jewelries and watches, although uh, personally I cannot understand why, um, because uh, one watch is like all, all watches tell at the same time. Anyway, uh, anyway, the uh, please ignore that. Yeah. So, so therefore, we think the uh, the, the the record earnings might be we might have been seen the record earnings last year for for the likes of Hourglass, Cortina, and, and the rest in this sector. Thank, thanks very much. Um, I think, what is the target? Uh, I can't tell you the target price for SIE yet. Sorry, the, the reports will be out shortly. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, there's one quick, just a quick one on uh, comment on Capital Pacific Oak Reef. Yeah, so uh, Capital Pacific Oak Reef and Prime both are hammered equally by the, by actually manual life sentiment. So manual life, as you all know, is undergoing a strategic review. Yeah, so of course, uh, like all these three listed uh, pure play US REITs, they it's hard for them to trade in different directions. So as manual life is uh you know what's happening with them, yeah, then they are they are, they got sold down. So which is why uh Prime and Capital Pursuit O also got, got sold down. I mean that's not the only reason why it's trading so low. I mean of course there are other things like the US office segment, all these. Uh there are a lot of headwinds there, higher vacancies, moving up from California, etc. Yeah, so for capital possible, uh, their fundamentals are similar to prime. They, yeah, their gearing levels are alright. Yeah, it's they they're not as bad as it as a uh, manual life. So yeah, but for capital possible, we do not cover. I think that's all the comments I have. Uh, yeah, not sure if there's any. I don't see any questions. So, uh, perhaps we we could end here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Darren. So with that, yep. we will we'll, uh, call it a close for this Monday's webinar. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, please join us again next week. If you have more questions, please uh, uh, send them over. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you.